places all over the world, Germany and other places, with masks on. And so kind of meeting people for the first time without the mask has been uh, pretty interesting, to say the least. But in any case, um, excited to be here. You know, I take a, I come from a very different background than everyone else on this panel. And uh, from a cloud perspective specifically, you know, I come more from the networking and the access side, right? So, you know, data dominance is critical, but having access to that data is, you know, first and foremost important to be able to act on that data and provide that data dominance. What's been interesting over the last few years, especially, you know, with COVID and kind of realizing from an industry perspective that, you know, the way that we've been doing business, the way that needs to change to be able to support kind of a, the new workforce, the new kind of remote workforce, and, you know, from a warfighter perspective, being able to uh, compete in that tactical edge space. You know, one of the things that I've seen personally is a lot of new technology, a lot of new companies coming out with new capabilities, a lot of new buzzwords in the industry around cloud, around SASE, Secure Access Service, Edge, SD-WAN. Um, but one of the things that, you know, we all see in, in the federal space is, you know, new technology is sometimes scary, right? And the quote I always like to kind of start presentations with is a Henry Ford quote. If I had asked people what they wanted, they would have asked for a faster horse. But I think for us to achieve data dominance uh, in this kind of new generation, we really need to start to look at, you know, leapfrogging technology. We can't continue to operate using the best technology of the last decade. And there's been a lot of innovation within the industry, both from a cloud perspective, from a networking perspective, that has that has the capability to enable, you know, the DOD to operate much more effectively in this uh, cyber domain. So I just wanted to, uh, you know, talk about a few concepts, a few capabilities that I have seen. Uh, and what has been really interesting is I've, you know, with programs like ABMS and JADC2, you know, convergence and overmatch, I've seen a lot more interest from the government, more than, you know, ever before in being able to start to operate and investigate these new technologies, uh, you know, in a way that's collaborative with the industry. I mean, one of the things that Bill mentioned, you know, that resonates with probably a lot of folks here from an industry perspective are things like certification, right? You know, from most vendors' perspectives, you know, federal represents a much smaller part of their overall business. So, you know, as product managers, uh, engineers make decisions about product development, you know, the last thing they're thinking about is, you know, aisle five and aisle six certification or, you know, barely anyone could spell JITIC. So um, bringing on board these new technologies uh, and working with the DOD to ensure that there is a kind of a safe way to be able to demonstrate and develop those technologies, you know, and Technologies don't dis get disqualified because of certifications. It's critical to ensure that the government is getting the best technology and is working collaboratively with industry to develop on that technology. So with that being said, um, you know, from, from our perspective, you know, one of the things we talk about is a concept called mission-first networking, right? So, you know, in today's network, there is a huge gap between kind of an operator's uh, you know, needs in terms of being able to deliver capabilities. So, for instance, General Lawrence might need access to Office 365. How do we quickly orchestrate the environment to enable that capability? And there's a huge gap from that perspective to the world of networking, right? I mean, in the networking, we work on connecting 10.10 .10 to 20.20, not General Lawrence to Office 365. There's been a lot of new technologies uh, that have come to light to essentially enable kind of a new capability of being able to understand users, being able to understand applications, and improve how that connectivity happens across the cyber domain, uh, every, everything from edge to the cloud. So technology like session smart networking, session smart routing has the capability to, you know, help the warfighter not only simplify their, uh, you know, battle rhythm, their cyber domain, but also enable the, the end user to access the capabilities they need whenever and wherever necessary. The other uh, things that I have seen over the last few years, uh, also as Bill mentioned, is the, uh, the, the necessity to be able to operate at the tactical edge, especially in detail environments. Right? A lot of our warfighters, you know, are 
operating from all over, and uh, you know, as we've seen in Ukraine, uh, communications could get um, you know cut or degraded or denied pretty easily. So being able to kind of flip the script on cloud, right? Start at the edge and move to the enterprise versus starting at the enterprise and moving to the edge. I think it's critical to really provide that confidence and enable the cloud capability to the warfighter at the edge. Um, you know, we've seen a lot of vendors starting to develop and, uh, you know, we've done a lot of testing with partners like Microsoft and Dell and HP and AWS and others who have, you know, that edge cloud capability available today. And, uh, and it's very powerful to be able to bring those cloud capabilities and be able to do workloads locally and just transmit kind of the deltas or, you know, you know, the additional info across the WAN when necessary. Beyond that, I think the other capability that government has, you know, has been interested in is, you know, how do we commoditize cloud access, right? How do we provide that multi-cloud interop capability? What happens if the tactical edge loses, you know, connectivity to one cloud? How can they spin up that application or workload in another cloud or in another instance? So providing that level playing field, that common playing field that kind of commoditizes, it, you know, who that cloud provider is, I think is critical to enabling the warfighter to once again get more value out of the cloud infrastructure moving forward. And then lastly, how do we access the cloud, right? So Bill talked about, you know, SD-WAN capabilities, right? In today's environment, a lot of edge networks are designed to only operate over one type of network, you know, either SATCOM, and if that SATCOM goes down, there's a lot of reconfiguration and hand jamming that needs to happen to move that workload to another network. SD-WAN really provides that capability to dynamically kind of allocate and allow the warfighter to operate in whatever environment using whatever networking capabilities available to access the applications, the workloads, or get out to wherever they need to get out uh, from a data perspective. Um, you know, I, I, I like to talk about it, you know, SD-WAN really provides that, you know, Waze or Google Maps-like capability across the network. What customers want to be able to do is allow that, or, you know, allow that simplicity to happen across the network path. So as, as uh, network conditions change, as paths become denied, uh, denied or degraded, how do you ensure that the traffic continues to seamlessly move across different paths without losing connectivity, without losing the session state? So if you're in the middle of an important phone call or if you're watching a UAV video stream and your primary link goes down, how do you ensure that the traffic just works, right? How do you ensure the network self-forms, self-heals itself just to ensure that um, the traffic continues? And as the end user, you're really kind of doing what you need to be doing, which is operating the mission. And lastly, doing this all in a simplified fashion, right? We, we don't have the capability to send experts to the tactical edge. Uh, you know, we don't have DCIEs and, you know, super experts out there. So this has to be simple that anybody could operate. So these are the things that I'm seeing from a networking perspective, from an industry-wide perspective. Um, and, you know, I welcome any additional questions on that connectivity piece to the cloud. Thank you. All right, thank you. Can everybody hear me? All right, very good. I tell you, you know, one, it's, it's an honor. Thanks for staying here so late. And, uh, you know, and it's an honor to be here, be on this panel, you know, with these fine folks that's here. What I bring is a different perspective. When you look at it, we're representing the systems integrator piece, where when you look across the table, I thought Bill did a great job when he talked about data at the edge. So I'm going to focus on a couple of these elements as I see how we're going to bring these together because we're currently partnering with all three of these on various programs, you know, just even in my portfolio. 
But then also you look at angels. He talks about the face of warfare has changed. And it has. Right? So, and then you look at Boris where he talks about the access to the data itself. The key piece is data. And what General Lawrence started off with, the key word that he mentioned right at the top of this was trust. How do you trust that data that is secure, it hasn't been changed, and that you can be able to use it to be able to support decisions in a real-time environment? Right? Well, this new concept is out there called zero trust. Who's heard of it? Right? I mean, if you walk down the hall, I mean, any of the aisles, and you look across the floor, how many people have zero trust on their, you know, their panels, right, that's, you know, displayed there? A single solution isn't going to get you the zero trust, where you have to assume that an adversary is inside your network. You trust no one, and you validate everything. So, you know, when you talk about the face of work to figure out change, you know, long are the day, you know, gone are the days we're in the process of really transitioning from being able to protect your network from the outside and actually looking at it, protecting it from the inside, from the data. That's where everyone, everybody here talks about the importance of data. So when we look at zero trust and you go bring it across and, you know, as a systems integrator, we look at it as a problem set of where you look at the different pillars that makes up zero trust. And I'll just walk it down through the data piece, which starts with user, device, network, and then it goes to the applications and then the data. You've heard Boris talk about the network itself, access to the data, right? So when we look, take those pieces that's there, the very first part of implementing this is you've got to validate that user, right? So the one thing that we have, and I think this uh, did a great job of doing, was starting an, an effort to build out an identity credential and access management solution. So using that as an example, let me just kind of walk you through how when we talk about that data, the dominance, because it does rely on the cloud. Right? It relies on the cloud, it relies on networking, it relies on high compute capability as well. Right? So we've taken that, that solution set, that identity piece for ICANN, and we looked at it as a capability, regardless of the actual specific vendors that are providing each of those capabilities. And in our enterprise solution, we're currently building out for DISA right now is the enterprise ICANN solution. It has three main components. It has the identity provider, which we're all familiar with, you know, being able to validate an individual user. Uh, the automated active provisioning. That's where we've injected automation in to be able to manage those accounts and be able to validate that user against a master user record, which really is that source of truth, which is the key for being able to understand and have that trust in the data elements itself. So, but that alone right there gives you an enterprise solution that we're building out currently in the Microsoft Azure environment to provide an enterprise capability. But we just talked about the need to have that at the edge. Well, what we've done is looked at it from a holistic standpoint of, okay, we have this enterprise capability. We partnered with our same non-traditional partners and vendors, and we created an ICAM at the edge capability that still enables that connection back to the enterprise for being able to validate that user against the master user record, right? So you're able to, if you lost connectivity to the source, being which is located CONUS because of it being at the appropriate impact levels and such, you're still able to leverage the capabilities built into that ICAM foundation. But with our edge solution, we've actually went two steps forward with additional capabilities, which is privilege access management. Because when you have privilege, you know, your super user access, whether it's a root user on Linux or an administrator access on a Windows side, you're going to have to limit. I mean, normally the person has access to that. That's what a hacker really loves is being able to try to get those credentials and being able to navigate across your enterprise. Well, with PAM, Public Access Management, you're able to limit the specific restriction. You can restrict those, have temporary access. You can audit those, you know, find out exactly and log those capabilities and the actions that each one of those are doing and least privilege while implementing some of those. But that next component element is what ties into that second pillar of zero trust, which is the device itself. With attribute-based access control, ABAC, we're all used to role-based access control, right, where you have your least privilege and you implement all these different roles, assign people to the roles. Well, we understand, I mean, how do you impact or how do you limit or, you know, put in precautions against internal threats? With ABAC, you can do that. You can actually have additional measured attributes assigned to each individual based off of their device, time of day they're accessing the data, the location, the actual building that they're actually logging in from. 
you can, additional attributes will be added that are provided to the AVAC, which is down to the data level. So when we talk about this solution set of zero trust, of being able to identify, and it's no longer managing it, just access to a network, but also down to that data level, which all three, all, everybody on this panel talked about the importance of the data side. Now you have a complete solution that takes you from that user all the way through assuring that that user is the right user and has access to the data. Now what we've done is, okay, okay the so what is like, you know, an example of where this really adds value. And I'll kind of close with that four questions. Is, is leveraging, you know, a chat capability. You have, you know, pick a country over here, pick a country over here, and you have the United States. Single application can be shared across all three, even though company or country A can't talk to country B about a specific topic. But using ABAC, you're able to filter out certain topics, certain conversations where it cannot be able to go to the respective user. So you can create those different rule sets, those you know profiles, actually, and set those up ahead of time as you know, the decision point. But then you can enforce them at the actual user level. So every conversation, even in a chat capability, that data level can be controlled as to who has access to the data piece instead of trying to limit access and have all these bilat type networks set up in between. You can have a single application with multiple users that you just establish the specific controls for. It's a great capability, and I mean, if you're interested, we can talk to you more about it at our booth. But that's just an example. When we look at it from a systems integrator, perspective, we look across, how do we leverage all the capabilities that all of our partners have in being able to come up with that complete solution that not only provides an enterprise capability at the cloud level, but then also be able to support specific, you know, OCONUS and regional level, all the way down to tactical level implementation of that capability. Right. I look forward to your questions. Thank you. Ma'am, I've got eight so far. You want me to go ahead and roll with them? Okay, first one. What do you think is the best path for private sector vendors to connect with the DOD? And the two part, does the DOD prefer resellers or systems integrators to facilitate demos? Or is there a forum for industry to connect directly with the DOD? <laughs> We're going to get this up on the screen for you, too. Oh, there you go. Are you seeing it now? when we talk about the best path for private sector vendors to connect with the DOD. I'd say at least on our side, we're seeing that the best path for us to connect with the DOD is actually to go through partners. Our partner network is, um, I, I think we have seen relatively consistently that the best way for us to implement cloud and get cloud to the warfighters the most quickly is to use our partners to, because they're going to come up with some of the most inter interesting solutions. We've got the SIs that are actually integrating and implementing them. Um, we've got some of the most innovative companies and disruptive companies in the defense uh, industry are actually using the cloud to be able to get to scale. Um, and they're getting um, access to the warfighter almost immediately. And so I think, at least on the cloud perspective, partners is 100% the way that we're seeing the most impact. Yeah, I would agree with that. I think just from a general you know, vendor perspective, most vendors who do business uh, in the federal space work through a channel ecosystem. So, um, you know, I've worked at companies like Juniper, Riverbed, you know, Expand, Sonus. Every one of those has leveraged a, you know, channel partner ecosystem uh, from a go-to-market perspective. Um, 
and kind of depending on the customer's needs and the requirements, uh, I think determines whether, you know, the reseller or the systems integrator, you know, would be the right approach. Um, you know, obviously for kind of small direct acquisitions, the reseller model seems to kind of work best through, you know, through, uh, you know, things like soup or whatever, but, um, you know, when it comes to large scale products where you need multi-vendor engagement, that's really where I think systems integrators add a lot of value. So, you know, today we're working on many pro projects where, you know, we're working with other vendors including, you know, Microsoft or HP and that's where the systems integrators have that capability to put together, you know, kind of a large scale solution and support, um, you know, these larger demo environments. So. Hopefully that helps. you is so, so us sitting here as a kind of third party OEM from my perspective, we love all of the hyperscaler. We're, we're best friends with Microsoft and Google and AWS and Oracle and IBM. We don't have a favorite because in the private sector, the term of art today is secure hybrid multi-cloud. Okay, so the large Fortune 50 and Fortune 100 companies want multi-cloud very much like what you see the, jet, the, the JWCC going after, what you saw the, the agency go after with C2E. But the challenge is, is to really achieve multi-cloud. That just doesn't mean that it, from my DOD data center, I have a connection into Azure and a connection into Google and a connection to AWS. That's not truly multi-cloud, though you can still lever them against each other. Not that we want to cause any infighting, but multi-cloud in the aspect of where you want to get to is where you can have a workload running in a Google cloud that can access data over in an Azure S3 bucket or at the edge in your private enterprise bucket. So that's where we want to get to in the secure hybrid multi-cloud and that is hard. It's way harder than just saying it. And, and the challenge out there, and I will tell you what's happening in industry today because we're getting asked to do this for private sector companies. Make us a secure hybrid multi-cloud, thank you. By their nature, us people in the private sector don't make it easy for you to go work with a competitor, right? I don't need to break that economics down for you. That's not in our nature to do that, okay? But what I will tell you, since of so much of cloud technology, first of all, it's very new, right? I mean, Docker was 2013, CNCF, Cloud Native Computing Federation, 2015. This is not like it's been around forever. What has happened in the open source private industry space is we, are, we, private industry open source, are starting to solve this multi-cloud problem because we heard about ICAM, Identity Access Management. Well, well, what is spoken in one hyperscaler environment doesn't speak to the other. And everybody here in DOD runs probably a certificate authority from the person at the end of the table here, most likely. But, but that certificate doesn't get recognized by my friend here from Google outrightly because Google Anthos uses a different identity management and security framework and it's theirs and that's why they're so secure and they don't want to start trusting outside. So what's happening in the private sector and this is, you know, this is for you to write down at Google later. I use, I use Google. Look at that. Or Bing. You can Bing it too. Alright. You can also Bing it. I, I use Bing. Uh, so, okay, okay, back to the stat. It's called Secure Production Identity Framework for Everyone, S-P-I-F-F-E, SPIFI, kind of cool. But, but what's happening in the open source Cloud Native Computing Foundation space is a project, very much like Kubernetes started as a project, and it's now been in incubation status for a couple of years, but it's SPIFI, and that is what's enabling you to operate in between, in between multi-cloud. So do some research on SPIFI, and the runtime environment is Spire. So your spiffy runtime environment is what you put in each of your environments, and that is what does that negotiation and translation from your 
Microsoft Certificate Authority trying to access AWS, and then AWS trying to launch a workload inside Google Distributed Cloud. There's got to be some middleware in there, and none of us are necessarily going to build that to make that easy. That's happening in the open source. And so the project that has become the primary project to enable secure hybrid multi-cloud, secure is the zero trust framework, right? And so SPIFI and Spire support zero trust, really help that MTLS connection with your distributed services, is SPIFI and Spire. So the general's right, multi-cloud is hard with data access because of the way we lock down our cloud environments. And so I would encourage you to start looking at SPIFI and Spire because Fortune 50 companies, Fortune 100 companies, that's how they're starting to do it. Yeah, absolutely. I, I thank you very much for that. I also, you honestly, we, I, I'm going to underscore everything that Bill just said. Huge advocates of multi-cloud um, on the Microsoft side. And I will tell you, just fundamentally, as a person who, I was in the Marine Corps for 23 years. I'm a warfighter at my core. I want to give our adversary a targeting problem. I don't want to give them one cloud to have to jack around with, and I want to give them three or four clouds to make it very, very difficult for them to access my data. So across the board on the Microsoft side, we will tell you all day long if there's a cloud vendor, and sorry for any of my cloud vendor colleagues in here, if there's a vendor in here telling you that you should go with one cloud, I would break, raise the flag immediately and, and tell you that, that is not the way to go. We should not be doing that way as a nation. Um, so there's, a, there's, I think that that particular aspect of it is inc incredibly, incredibly, incredibly important. The other thing too is when you think about it, we all look at security very differently. So the way that Microsoft looks at adding security to our cloud space is very different than the way that Google looks at the way that they would add security to their cloud space, the AWS, Oracle, like name your cloud provider. I also want that level of redundancy um, whenever it comes to security on all of the clouds that I'm going to operate on, especially with my most sensitive data. And then you start to add allied nation data into it. You want that level of complexity associated with everything you're doing whenever you're trying to protect all of the different secrets. And I know we talked a little bit also about the um, whether you can trust your data, as Jim brought up a little while ago. Um, we've also seen a really interesting trend taking place on the Ukraine side, where now we can't get enough open source data added into that battle space. Um, that becomes a trust of data type of problem and scenario. When you're taking uh, unclassified, um, sometimes not 100% trusted data, and you're introducing that into classified data, it starts to become at a level of complexity that, um, in a lot of ways, having multiple vendors that can take a look and vet um, the different types of analysis that you're doing on different data sets, it's very, very important to have that diversity in platform. <laughs> okay, no, I mean, I, I can talk to this because, I mean, when we look at it from a, a corporate standpoint, I mean, we're required to report, I mean, just like everyone, everybody here at the table, all of our companies are required because we're publicly traded companies for any type of cyber incidents for us to be able to report it, but then also go through the right procedures to make sure that we remediate that cyber vulnerability. So when it comes to fixing an issue associated with cyber, I mean, it's not going to be, it may come in and via a DOD route, but it'll impact, impact the enterprise. So it becomes a wider spread problem. And it may not just be targeted just to like our specific company, it could be also at others, which is why the reporting is so necessary to make sure that the word gets out that, hey, this is happening to us because of this reason. That way other people, other companies can be able to shore up their defenses as well. Yeah, I, w I would just say, um, you know, from my time at multiple, you know, OEMs and vendors, I mean, taking zero-day cyber threats uh, or attacks has always been, you know, the highest priority. And, and most companies that I've, actually all the companies that I've worked for when, you know, vulnerabilities like Hardbleed came out, I mean, we had, you know, fixes within a matter of hours. It always took, you know, the highest precedence. Um, and, you know, I think from a corporate perspective, they understand that 
you know, having trust behind the vendors critical for, you know, our, not only our corporate partners, but our federal partners as well. So being able to resolve these types of cyber threats is of utmost importance to a lot of, you know, vendors that do, uh, you know, public companies and vendors that do business, you know, with the federal government and a lot of the, uh, you know, Fortune, you know, 1,000 companies. So. I can't speak for that because I will kick this down to the end. What I will tell you is there is a, a some uniqueness to JWCC that we didn't necessarily see in the original JEDI contract uh, in that there is a, a more explicit demand for uh, disconnected cloud management capabilities for that edge user. Um, and and that, that is kind of differentiation we saw between JEDI initially and JWCC. I don't recall anything specifically demanding interoperability. Angel, do you have any? Well, I mean, I think the, the nature of the, the contracts are when you move to a multi a multi vendor award, you're in some ways introducing the expectation that the cloud providers are going to work together. Um, I'd say across all of DoD, this is a really unique space for us because just like we wouldn't expect Boeing and they're, you know, 737 to collaborate with Lockheed Martin on the F-35. Um, we, you know, a lot of times, I, it's interesting to me because we a lot of times forget that this whole inability for vendors to work together is not necessarily a new issue. We've been dealing with this for years. I mean, you can't get, I, I remember I, I flew um, the uh, C-130 Hercules Airborne Weapons Kit. We had three separate weapon systems on the aircraft. None of them would talk to each other. So if I wanted to switch from a Hellfire over to a Griffin missile, I had to shut my laptop down, let it down, like load up both nice and slow. I had to reopen the new laptop, which is thick as a gateway. You know those gateway notebooks, those big, huge, fat, like, tough book looking things? Had to lift the tough book up, let it load, make sure all the missiles were reloading. I mean, there was no interoperability in any of those things, and that was, like, six years ago. Um, so I'd say that the JWCC contract is giving us a really interesting opportunity to almost force collaboration in a place where warfare is fundamentally changing. Um, so I would hope that this could actually be a little bit of a, a, a gateway into better behavior across all programs across the entire Department of Defense. And it's going to be hard, as Bill pointed out. It's, it is, it is not, um, in some ways, making multi-cloud environments work and be interoperable together is not necessarily a problem of will. Technically, it's very, very hard. It's very, very, very challenging to be able to get all of those networks to work together um, seamlessly. And so it's going to be something that we're going to have to work together. Is that classification implying secret top secret, or are we talking about meta tagging of data? Two different total concepts. I'm happy to stab at this one if you want. Okay. Um, so one of the really interesting things that we were, were starting to look at data as well is um, whenever we started building these disconnected um, hyperscale clouds where they were, we were really looking at everything. The DOD set these requirements based off of physical security. We're going to build a secret cloud. It's going to be air gas. It's going to be completely separate from everything else. We're going to build a t top secret cloud. That's going to be independent. It's going to be separate from everything else. We're going to have our unclassified clouds. They're going to be separate from everything else. And then add on now all of our allied nations that want to have all of their air gap clouds. Now wash, rinse, repeat that same scenario across every single nation. I'm sure you guys can kind of see what, what, smell what I'm stepping in right now, that none of them are connected. And so moving data between each of those clouds, um, we're starting to, we were building clouds based off of an antiquated perception of what security actually looks like. If we're ever going to get to the point where we realize that we must be able to move data across a multitude of different clouds, we have to start operating on a common fabric. 
and then putting our focus of effort, where do we want our risk? Do we want our risk to be having air gap pieces of data that we can never connect? Or do we want our risk to be absorbed by the fact that we have to constantly make sure that we are staying on top of our cybersecurity off of a common fabric, but we're able to move data across different types of classifications and turning those pipes on and off based off of the type of data we want to move. Um, and so I'd say the greatest challenge, at least in my opinion, is getting our customers, and specifically I mean the Department of Defense, to reimagine what data security actually looks like, to get away from it's not just physical security. Physical security is absolutely important, 100% important, but is that the most important thing any longer? And I would almost argue that it's, it's very important, but it could also be our critical vulnerability because it also keeps us from being able to share the right types of data in the right environment. Yeah, and just to add, sorry, I just wanted to add to that, you know, going along with classification of data is identification of data as it transverses the network. Um, you know, kind of, what happens today is, you know, security takes a front row seat to everything. And so what customers do is they add, you know, tunnels and encryption and, you know, all of these security paradigms to the traffic, to the data. So by the time it hits the WAN, I mean, it's like triple tunneled uh, and you have no way to identify what that traffic is. So if you need to do something with that data midstream, it's very, very hard to act on that data. I know the Air Force is, is uh, coming up with a concept called ubiquitous black fabric. Um, and, you know, as part of that concept, what they want to be able to do is instead of tunneling all of the data, you, you leverage something like metadata to be able to identify that data in some way or fashion anywhere across the network while keeping the actual payload secure. And that would allow you to continue to uh, kind of operate on that data in the most intelligent way possible across that black fabric without exposing, you know, the, the key, at, you know, the, the actual payload. So I just wanted to kind of add that as we think about, you know, securing and classifying data across the WAN. And if that question was asking for recommended private sector companies that do data classification, I mean, there are a bunch of them out there, and I'm, I can't lend a, you know, as they, they, we, we as a OEM get engaged. Um, there used to be one called PAMR. Uh, there's Big ID, and they all specialize in data classification uh, of different sorts and different types that you run against, and they have different proof points of 90% positive, you know, et cetera, et cetera. The challenge that the DoD has, and I can totally concur, is is a lot of our data is messy. Uh, it has been uh, captured and stored and not tagged. We don't know its source and its pedigree, and so without any of that, your ability to trust it, and then we get into trustable AI, right? You can't trust your AI if you don't trust your data. You can't trust your data if you don't have its pedigree. So it, it, it's one thing to just run an algorithm to identify and classify different data sets, but without its pedigree and, and the veracity of it, then you're really going to struggle with that, that trustable AI, which we're all trying to get after. The, and this goes you know, to what everybody's been saying up here, where the importance of the data, and actually when you look at, I mean, reimagining the way you secure data, I think is, is brilliant. I mean, if you, you're able to just tag the data appropriately and being able to have it to where you have the right access to that, where you actually are, again, limiting access based on the data, you can almost collapse all the networks for being able to support, you know, things like data analytics across different levels of classification. So when we look at data analytics, this is where when we talk about, it really goes back to the title of what we're up here talking about, you know, leveraging cloud technologies to support data that's dominant. You do that with analytics. And the best tools capable that are out there are what's being provided, you know, from these you know, big cloud providers like Microsoft that has the native capabilities right there close to, you know, the data where it's resided. If it's inside the Azure environment and then you pick another, you know, partner AWS or Google, right? that leverage HPE's no hardware, that you're accessed by Juniper Network to get to it. Right? So when we look at the analytics piece of it, it's very important to be able to leverage, not just you know, like when we look at data analytics that we've understood when you're analyzing the data to get deeper insights into, you know, to be able to support your decision making. Well, now you can actually be able to have the ability to implement artificial intelligence 
leverage some of the machine learning you know, capabilities that we've heard about. So when you have that enhanced compute power that the cloud actually offers, you know, as they pay for use and they can scale and you have all those abilities that come with, you know, the benefits of a cloud, you're able to go and then benefit from that type of analytics to support your decision. So when we look at, you know, implementing these capabilities, we look at it from the standpoint of what are those latest technologies that you have to offer? And there was an earlier question of dealing with, you know, like the vendors and how do you access the DOD? Is when we look at all these companies that's out there, those companies have niche capabilities that really align, they tie in to the different platforms, the cloud platforms, and they leverage the hardware and they access it via the network. Right? It's the tie-in of those that have the deep skill sets and coming up with those niche capabilities that can support things like data analytics to enhance that overall process because you know, bringing it back to the war fighting side of it, you know, the we want to be able to shorten that decision time. That OODA loop, we need to make it smaller than our adversary, right? We need to be able to act on the information that we have that we've trusted actually came from a reliable source that the right person is actually accessing it and giving it to you, right? So. Number one, thank you for being open-minded enough to be able to start to engage with industry. Um, I would say that there's not, uh, my, we don't have a monopoly on all of the different industry people that are in here that are super, super motivated and excited to be able to help and work through um, really, really difficult defense problems. We, we love our nation. We love the security that we see across the globe. And um, thank you for anybody who's here that's uh, really thinking about being out-of-the-box solutions that industry can actually bring to the government problem set. Um, I do want to like really quickly go back to that last question because I thought it was a really beautiful question about analytics. Um, I will tell you that that's, that the name of the game is, is the analytics game, um, 100%. That is absolutely that's the name of the game. I, and I'm going to butcher this number, but after the Osama bin Laden raid, um, I think it was something only in the neighborhood of maybe 5% of all that data actually was uh, exploited. Um, that's a tragedy because how much of that, that information could have actually ended up in some type of like a really, really fantastic targeting scenario for a super bad guy almost immediately. Um, and the fact that a lot of that never got touched, um, there, the technology exists today to be able to solve those problems, um, allow industry to be part of that solution. We really, really want to help. And a lot of times it's, it's, it's absolutely not about money. Um, it's really about keeping our, our, our world safe and making our world a safer place and making sure that the United States stays a dominant force across this globe, not allowing adversaries that don't have the same level of, uh, of respect for individual rights and privacy. Um, we, we are that way in the United States. That, those are the fundamentals that we need to kind of stick to. And unfortunately, um, well, actually, fortunately, you've got an a, a, a industry base that is super eager to help make sure that we can maintain those levels of democracy across the planet. So thank you. All right, thank you. Okay, if you look at the, the resumes for all of us, I think we all have military backgrounds up here, and we're integrated in industry. The, it's, we're mission focused. What we are is about being able to support the warfighter. So as we look at being able to, as a systems integrator, you know, I said, you know, we partner with a lot of different companies, small businesses, large businesses, the vendors, the OEMs, to come up with that best solution that can support the warfighter. And the warfighter also means, you know, as we build out and you know, bringing it back to cloud, is that we understand that the, the you know, the networks that you're using to be able to fight wars are classified, right? So as we build out classified capabilities in the cloud and their enterprise capabilities, we have to understand you can't rely on just reach back back to the CONUS, that we need to have that complete solution that enables you to have that hybrid, that secure hybrid multi-cloud solution that supports OCONUS regional basis that is also leverages cloud. It's not an either or. It's a combined implementation of the solution, and that's what we look for. I mean, we really work hard to be able to provide that type of solution that actually looks at what is currently out there 
what you currently have, what you've invested in already, and how can we leverage that to be able to support your needs today by taking advantage of even the newer technologies that's always we find folks here continue to be able to produce. So thanks again for having me. So, um, you know, one of the things that I wanted to say to the leadership is as we embark on this new, you know, new world in technology, don't be afraid of change and don't be afraid of innovation. Um, you know, I know change is hard. Innovation, you know, is, it's scary, right? I mean, you have a workforce that might be very familiar with one type of technology, and so there's that level of comfort. But technology is moving at a very rapid pace, so unless kind of the leadership kind of understands and embraces change, you know, we're going to be relegated to continuing to use the best technology of the last decade. And I think along that, uh, along that line, you know, if, if the DOD wants to kind of be on the bleeding edge of technology, I think it's important to continue part, to partner with the industry. Um, you know, as I mentioned earlier, there's certain requirements in the DOD and the federal space that, you know, enterprise customers don't need and don't understand. So as we work together, as we, you know, might, and you know, go about these endeavors on pilot efforts and, um, you know, try things out and test things out, you know, we're going to run into things where, you know, things might not work as we first expect, but I think, you know, as long as the DOD continues to partner with industry and continues to work together towards achieving kind of that goal, the mission that's at hand, um, you know, I think it's going to be a big win-win for everybody involved. Um, so that's kind of what I wanted to throw out there. Um, you know, don't be afraid of change. Do it. So I guess I'll wrap up. So uh, first, I'd like to say thanks uh, for all of you who are still in uniform uh, for continuing to do what you do. Uh, most of us, as was said, who have stepped across the line uh, still have an affinity and a desire to be on the team and to help. Uh, and whereas the private sector is motivated by certain things, most of us are not. So, again, thank you for continuing to serve, and uh, we appreciate what you do. Uh, adding to that, the, the, the Defense Department is still a people business. So we talked a lot about technology and a lot about these new things happening, but the reality is you have to bring your people with you on this journey. It is a huge cultural shift. Um, in, you know, the change, being scared of change is one thing, but, but you really have got to get buy-in from your workforce because it's your workforce that's going to be the ones executing this new cool idea called secure hybrid multi-cloud, right? And I guarantee you they probably don't have any of the certifications required to make that happen. And there's a disenfranchisement fear that is real. Uh, so you've got to have a people-focused uh, uh, people focused plan uh, to move down this modernization train, and that's got to be front and center. Uh, the last thing I'll tell you, or I'll say is, you know, cloud is a style of computing. It is not a place to put your stuff. So as you adopt that and you train your people, my only request and guidance is start with the edge first, right? That's where the private sector has figured it out. You know, they're making their decisions at the edge so they don't have to move their data around. Swarm learning is real. Uh, getting your smart edge nodes talking is real. And it very much applies to what the DOD does with its, with its spread out battlefield, with its intelligence nodes around the battlefield. Let's, you know, trust that it's there. Start with small projects. Get some, some belief in what you're doing. Small victories matter. Uh, but, but you've got to get your forces to buy in because they'll be the ones carrying the burden. And, and once you, once they see it work, uh, then you just got to get out of the way. Uh, because it truly is a game changer. So, again, thanks for all of us on the panel this opportunity to speak to you. Uh, we, we hope that you got something out of it, and we are now in the way between you and happy hour. So, General, thank you, Don. Did you? Yeah. Oh, I got people. We got people out there.
on. Yep. Okay. Yeah. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you very much today. Uh, again, a big mahalo to our panel members for giving us their remarks and spending their time with us today. I think this is an age-old question. We've been trying, at least from my lifetime, at least 30 years, of how to get the right information to the right person at the right time to make an informed decision, whether it's a tactical ledge or whether it's in a headquarters building. Uh, so I think, again, we're going to keep talking about it because there's way more data than we've ever had before between all the sensors we have out there. And now we're actually adding, with all of our coalition partners, certainly all of more complexities within how do you share information as some of the panel members talked about where countries won't even talk to themselves. How do we do that at the tactical edge? So, again, thank you. I would like to say that on behalf of APSEA, uh, we're going to make a donation to the Friends of the Windward Wounded Warriors on your behalf. So thank you very much. I also have a challenge coin for each of you, which will highlight our 36th TechNet Indo-Pacific Conference. And believe it or not, we will later on this year in November have our 37th TechNet Indo-Pacific Conference. And we hope to see you all back here. So with that said, everybody, uh, it's 5 o'clock somewhere. And you're here as well. So, uh, so mahalo and have a good day. See you tomorrow.